Hey, Trevor Matthews here. I hope you're enjoying the video newsletter of these technical tips. If you hadn't have a chance to check out that free compressor troubleshooting guide, I still highly recommend searching for it in your junk mail or in your email. Just write free compressor guide. You should be able to find it and have that and bring that with you when you do an inspection on a compressor. And you should be, anytime you have a failed compressor and you don't know exactly why that failed, you need to look inside it. You need to inspect it. And if you're not inspecting it, you don't know how long till that next one's failed if you don't know what caused that failure. And when you go up to it and you got an electrical failure or a burnout, oh, it's electrical failure or burnout, 80% of the time that electrical failure is caused by a mechanical failure. Like we talked about two emails ago, overheating, last one, flooded starts, and all the rest of them that's in the guide, you need to figure out what cause that failure and if you don't know you have to inspect the compressor so we're going to talk about flood back and dive into what flood back is anytime the compressor is running and liquid refrigerant makes its way back to the compressor that is flood back that evaporator cannot boil off that liquid refrigerant can't absorb the heat out of the evaporator of that refrigerant and it makes its way back you lose control of your metering device all of a sudden it's sending a ton of refrigerant through and it's getting back to the compressor that is flood back and really it's when you have no superheat at the compressor we always talk about checking superheat at the evaporator it's even more important to check it at the compressor every time you're doing a service call or troubleshooting a compressor so liquid refrigerant return into the compressor while it's running, no superheat. As you can see, this is a scroll compressor. Here's the crankshaft, you have oil down here. So if you're having flood back happening, what happens, that liquid refrigerant gets in here. This is a hollow crankshaft. There's flinger fle feeds at the bottom. And what happens, it picks up the oil and feeds all the bearings. And then right here is your dry bearing underneath the oscillating scroll. And what happens when you get flood back, it starts to dilute oil is here, but as it starts to go up further and further, that liquid refrigerant starts to dilute the oil because it is a good cleaner. And it doesn't take a long time to do a lot of damage. If you have minor flood back, okay, it's, gonna, it's still going to do damage. But if you have major flood back happen constantly, what's going to happen is that this liquid refrigerant gets up to the top here, dilutes the oil, you get metal on metal, and then you have... This is what it looks like. So when you cut open a compressor and you see this bearing just bare like that, and you see this uh, uh, bushing and bearing just damaged like that, that means really 100% was flood back. Unless you have full signs of overheating, like it's really, but usually this would look cooked. It wouldn't look like this. It would look like there's a lot of powder and it's so dry that's overheating. But in this case, or loss of oil, but in this case, you can see that it's not, there's not a lot of overheat. This here is definitely flood back. And when you do an inspection on the compressor, it's easy to, easy to tell what type of mechanical failure it is when you have damage like this. Okay? So you want to make sure you check that superheat coming back to the compressor and inspect the compressor as well. When we talk about air cool compressors, Air cool compressors, when you have minor flood back, because your suction goes right into the, the head of the compressor. It's not, way different than a refrigerant, refrigerant cool compressor. So that refrigerant comes right in here. And if you have a little bit, it starts to wear. So as that piston's pumping up and down, that refrigerant goes on there. It's cleaning the lube right off there. There's a special thing that is put on the pistons and inside the compressor. It's called lube right. Helps for, with lubrication. But when you get liquid refrigerant in there, it starts to clean that lube right off. And then you start to get wear. This is the thrust surface. As it pushes up, right? As it pushes up, you get the, the thrust surface would be here. And so as that's cleaning it off, it starts to wear that piston until it can wear right through. If you have major uh, flood back, that causes a slug in a semi-hermetic. Two things cause a slug in an um, air-cooled semi-hermetic is oil, uncontrolled oil coming back, or major flood back, and that smashes the, the valves right away. Because as you can see, your refrigerant will come right in here. Now, all of a sudden, you're trying to compress liquid. 
So same thing if you have uncontrolled oil come back, you're trying to compress that oil and you're just smashing up that. So that's why it's so important to look inside these compressors because you'll be able to tell that. And now if you know that flood back happened, there's things to check. I gotta check the TX valve, I gotta check the coil, I gotta check the fan, I gotta check the airflow. All these different things you need to take a look at that we're gonna get into. But you need to inspect the compressor and you need to look inside. And if it's a smash or a slug air cool compressor, that is from flood back, uncontrolled or uncontrolled oil coming back to that compressor. Okay, now you gotta figure out what caused that. When we talk about semi-hermetic compressors, okay, these are refrigerant cool compressors. So if you have minor flood back happening on a semi-hermetic, you have the stator right here. You have the rotor here and there's generates a lot of heat. So it just really boils that off. It doesn't make its way over to the oil. Okay, here's the, there's a wall right here. This is the wall of the compressor from the stator and rotor to the crank, so the, the body. But when you start getting flood back, you have liquid refrigerant make it in in here. Then it makes its way all the way over into the oil. So when it makes its way into the oil and you start having a large amount of flood back happening, this oil, there's the oil holes drilled into the pump and it picks up that liquid refrigerant. And then it starts pumping liquid refrigerant through the compressor, which is really bad because now it starts to wash all these journals. So here's your, your piston uh, on here. So your rods and then your pistons. So your, your rod right here and then your rod right here. And then this is actually the bearing that should be in the housing, but it's on the crankshaft. It should be on the crankshaft because that's how bad this, com this image was that it wore. So now you got a little bit of oil, so there's not much wear, but you got worse wear, worse wear, and then until you got a failed bearing. So wear, more damage, more damage, and then you get that failed bearing. But there's a specific check for this. So if you have a compressor that is knocking really hard or if it shorted out you go out and it's short you need to do a few things you need to always pump it down safely lock it out get the refrigerant out re recover that refrigerant or put it into the system somewhere else and then you what you want to do is pull off the the heads and look inside there to see if there's any damage see if the pistons have any problems you also want to pull off that oil pump and that oil pump housing because you're not going to lose much oil unless you get too much oil in there because if you pull off the housing here's the oil level here it shouldn't drain out a lot of oil unless you get too much oil in that compressor so when you pull off that housing what you need to do is shake hands with the crankshaft that's what we call it so you grab it and you shake it up and down and when you do it up and down if there should be really no play maybe a little tiny tiny bit but very very minor back and forth you'll feel lots of play front and back so in and out you'll feel a lot of play but up and down you shouldn't really feel any play if you get a lot of play up and down that is flood back and now you can see well how come that refrigerant wasn't boiling off wasn't it being absorbed how did it make it through the evaporator all the way back here what is it the tx valve is it the the heaters is it the defrost problem is it the frozen coil all these different things that you need to think about because if you don't and you don't do this check here how do you know what caused that failure all right, you can go up to it. Yes, it's electrically failed because some of these parts that broke off here made its way through. No different than the scroll compressor, right? Most of the time you'll go up to the scroll and you know, oh, it's an electrical failure, it's a burnout. But you probably had something cause flood back, flooded starts, which wore that uh, bearing and pieces fell down onto the scroll stator and caused uh, electrical failure. No different than this. If you get journals starting to wear real bad, uh, bearings falling in, uh, into the um, compressor and then making its way through and then causing a short. You get spot burns, things like that from different types of mechanical failure. So this is why you do need to inspect these compressors. So important because when you start inspecting them, you're going to start seeing stuff all the time and you're going to see more and more and more and more. I've pulled hundreds and hundreds of compressors apart and every time I pull one apart, I learn more. Did I always know, figure out what caused the failure? No. But I learned the next time, if I seen something, it gave me an idea. That's a spot burn. That's flood back. That's flooded starts. That's overheating. That's loss of oil. All these different things. And it just takes time. Okay, how to prevent flood back. So there's a few things. Make sure you got good airflow. Make sure that condenser is clean. Oh, sorry, the evaporator is clean. When your evaporator starts to plug up, you cannot absorb that heat. That refrigerant cannot boil off. So it starts to make its way down to suction and then into the compressor and where you have no superheat at the compressor 
okay? You want to make sure there's proper air distribution. If you start building up a ton of ice in your evaporator, there's something wrong. It should build up some frost. doesn't matter if it's low temp or not. There's too much humidity or something. There's not enough defrost time. That you don't have enough hot gas coming back or cool gas. There's something going on. Your defrost differential valve is not set up properly. There's lots of different things to check. But if you get coils freezing constantly, there's something wrong. You need to fix the root cause of the problem because you're going to have more and more compressors fail. And you're going to have lots of callbacks. You don't want that. So you want to make sure there's proper airflow. So you get that airflow in, boil off that, absorb that heat and boil that refrigerant inside the evaporator. Next, suction accumulator prevents, helps protect against flood back. As you can see, here's the suction. It goes into accumulator. This accumulator can collect liquid refrigerant to protect that compressor. And then down here, there's a little hole. It meters back the refrigerant back to the compressor. So as it meters the back, it flashes. It doesn't do any damage. But even with the accumulators, if you have too much flood back happening and you fill these up or if this is not sized properly, you're going to potentially get flood back. Okay, this doesn't protect against flood it starts like we talked about in the last video. So you want to check for any sudden load changes. This is another big one after a defrost. Okay, it's a big one. So you have a, a huge defrost, massive load on that evaporator, on that coil, and all of a sudden the, the refrigerant turns on. That TX valve's wide open, okay? And it's sending a ton of refrigerant to, through. So after a defrost, you should be checking that compressor superheat. Evaporator superheat is very important, but I believe compressor superheat is even more important. You never set up your evaporator superheat to, for compressor superheat. There's something else going on. But you always want to make sure you have superheat. So for uh, bits of compressors, they say like 15 uh, degrees superheat on their, their HFC, HFO compressors, depending on the refrigerant. Copeland says they would like to see 20. But if you're running at 15, 10 and you know you're not going below that, and that's extreme cases, because you gotta check through all conditions, you're checking your superheat at the compressor, you just wanna make sure you're not getting anything lower than that, because when you start getting the liquid back, it starts diluting that oil, starts wearing on parts. Another one is a uh, properly sized metering device. If you have oversized uh, metering devices, that is a potential cause for flood back. If you have a one ton unit and you got a five ton uh, valve in there, well, it's not going to work properly. And first of all, it's going to hunt all over the place, but there's a good chance when it opens up, it's going to let enough refrigerant to start to cause flood back. Okay. Another one's refrigerant uh, charge. If you're on a critically charged system or a cap tube system and you're overcharged, there's a high chance you're going to flood back. So super heat is one of the most important things. It is the most important thing to check at the compressor for flood back. And it doesn't matter if it's a scroll, air cool compressor, semi-hermetic compressor. And how do you check it? Well, what you need to do is you need to use a gauge. You need to use a temperature probe at the compressor on the suction line. So you check your uh, temperature. On the suction line, as you can see right here, I got a temperature here of 22 degrees Fahrenheit or minus six Celsius, okay? We have a gauge on here. This is 448A example, 26 PSI or 1.8 bar, okay? And when we look over here, we have 22 Fahrenheit, subtract two, which is our SST. This is our SST, which you get. That's what's happening in your evaporator. We got 20 degrees superheat, okay? We got minus six uh, Celsius, then minus 17 Celsius would equal 11K to make sure that you have super heat. Once again, a must read is AE22-1182. Um, this is a, how to control liquid refrigerant in refrigerant and air conditioning uh, system. Highly recommend that again. I will throw it once again in this, um, down below this video. If you like this video, I shoot me an email, that is awesome. If you have friends that you think will benefit from these videos, please shoot them this email. There's gonna be a link below that they can click on to go to the free guide, sign up for this video newsletter. I'd really appreciate it. If you do have questions on things that you'd like to see me do videos on, please send them to me. I really wanna to try to help you out by getting you the information you need to do your job better, be better as a technician, as a refrigeration professional. My name is Trevor Matthews. Let's get a conversation going.